Do you actually have to be on cocaine to be on this podcast? It's a great day to be a Wildcat! What's up, everybody? You're listening to yet another edition of Cocaine Willie. I'm your commissioner, Bob Trollsby, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, good chef Andre Napier and Fireball Matt Marchesini. Tonight, we have another night game, this time in the hub city of Lubbock, Texas, and another team's Super Bowl blackout game where the 3-3 three and three overall but 2-1 and one in Big 12 play Texas Tech Red Raiders will face off against a 3-2 and two overall and now 1-1 one one in conference play Kansas State team who needs a big bounce back win after a dismal effort in Stillwater against the Oklahoma State Cowboys. To help us preview the matchup and hopefully lighten the mood a little bit, we have our friend Kyle from the Gambling Gauchos to give us the scoop on this year's Red Raider team. Kyle, thanks a ton for being able to join us again tonight. Uh, another recurring guest helping us preview last year as well as this year's matchup against Tech. And, and you know, frankly, Tech has had a very fascinating season this year. So I'm, I'm excited to preview the team with you tonight. Um, started off with kind of that dark horse treatment all offseason. Everybody was giving Tech the same treatment that K-State got the previous offseason as Big 12 title, dark horse, Big 12 title contender, uh, but immediately went out and lost to a pretty good Wyoming team, it turns out, after, after they've started off very, very well in Laramie uh, and keeping it tight for most of the game, but eventually dropping to a very good Oregon team at home as well. Uh, and then losing that first conference matchup of the year to what's turned out to be a fairly decent West Virginia team. So I would say to start off, there's three pretty quality losses at this point in retrospect. Um, and then you bounce back in a big way against Houston two weeks ago and then Baylor in the butt bowl last week. But the rocky start to the year led some to believe that maybe this team had been overhyped coming out of the last year. Uh, last year's finish to the season. So I just shoot us straight here. What's the state of the union for Texas Tech football heading into week seven, and, and is Texas Tech the best three and three team in the country right now? <laughs> yeah, no, you you captured it pretty well, and we kind of joked amongst ourselves when we were like, you know, one and three or two and three that, you know, we were, a, you know, potentially the best one and three team in the country and all that stuff, which was just uh, copium. But, yeah, we, uh, we opened in Wyoming, and we were warned about that, and we knew the whole deal on the altitude and – you know, other fan bases were like, hey, why did y'all schedule that game? Like, you know, either play them at home or play them in the third game of the season, but don't go up there for your season opener. And, you know, we're like, ah, you know, it'll be all right. You know, we're 13, 14 point favorites. Even if we come out sloppy, you know, we can we can leave with a dub. And uh, my co-host, Rob and I, we made the trip. And I don't know if y'all saw that game, but it was a rain delay. We get up 17-0 and like, you know, basically one quarter in, I was like, sweet. We are who we thought we were. It's a good football team. We're about to leave here with a, you know, 50 point win or whatever. Great trip. And then we just like completely pissed down our leg for 48 minutes. Don't score again until the last drive of regulation to force overtime and uh, then lose in double OT uh, to, yeah, like you said, a team that looks like probably one of the better group of five squads that in a, in a Big 12 this year that seems a little bit down to me, kind of in the middle or toward the back end. Like if Wyoming were in the Big 12, I think they'd, they'd probably still be like a bowl team. I'd probably say they'd go like six and six or something. Uh, then, yeah, you go blow for blow with Oregon, have the ball down one with like a minute and a half left and trying to make a play, throw a pick six. Uh, the worst part about that is we not only lost, but didn't cover when it looked like we had it in the bag. So, yeah, you're sitting there at 0-2, and, and it was like, you know, I don't know. Fans tried to cope after the Wyoming loss. You made the Kansas State 2022 comparison. They're like, hey, well, you know, they lost to Tulane, and Tulane wound up pretty good. And and then you, like, lose to Oregon the next week. It's like, okay, yeah, we're not, we're not going to be 2022 Kansas State. But the loss that actually bothers me the most is the West Virginia one. I know that they're off to a 2-0 start. I don't think they're that good. Like, they beat – an absolutely atrocious pit squad at home. They beat Tech in a game where we played horribly on offense. Our, our quarterbacks, quarterback changed mid-game because our starter broke his leg. But combined, they complete about a third of their passes. We uh, 
we don't hand the ball off to our running back um, in the first half. He has like three carries, and then he finishes the game with like 27 carries for 100-something yards. It's like, well, maybe if we had done that in the first half. So I would love another shot at them. I think we, we really should be 3-0 and right now in the Big 12, and if that were the case, then – yeah, you let bygones be bygones with the tough losses to Wyoming and Oregon, and like you're kind of sitting, kind of waiting for Texas or OU to fall a little bit and ready to pounce. But instead, it feels like those two are on kind of an inevitable collision course for Arlington, and uh, you know teams like Kansas State, West Virginia, Texas Tech, you know are going to have to scratch and claw to get to five and four. And I just unfortunately for their last year in the Big Twelve, I think that they're probably going to be the two teams in the title game. So. I think all three losses for our fan base were like, you know, damn, we should have had all three, but like even give us one or two and we would feel a lot better about the season right now. Yeah. And thinking about Joey McGuire as a whole, um, you know, last season, end of the year, very, very strong off season has been great, especially in the recruiting space. Um, picking up some really big um, high school recruits, transfers coming in. Overall, what is the fan base's kind of feeling on Joey McGuire at this point? Albeit, probably wish you know you would have had a better record right now. But um, are fans still bought in with him? You know, is there anything that you want to see more from him or less of him as we reach the halfway point uh, on his second season? I think, like personally, uh, I've always been all in. I was actually clamoring for him back after the 2020 season, I thought Matt Wells should have been fired a year earlier. And I think they didn't make the move because it, it had only been two years. It was COVID. But even back then, I was like, let's go get Joey from Baylor. Like, he'd be a perfect fit. And so he comes in, he energizes the fan base, like you're saying, kind of wins the offseason every year with how well he does on the recruiting trail. I think the only slip up to this point was kind of how explicitly he talked up this team. Like it's one thing for a coach to exude confidence and and to say, I believe in my players, I believe in my staff, I think we're gonna have a good season. But Joey does not give you the like typical coach speak, just kind of political talk around and answer and you know, not really say anything. He was out there saying this offseason that, you know, our our twenty twenty three squad would beat the bowl team by fourteen points and we expect to win the Big Twelve championship. This is the best team I've ever coached. Tyree Wilson goes number seven overall in the NFL draft, but our defensive line is going to be even better without him. Just like we have the best quarterback room in the country. Again, these like very explicit kind of tangible um, expectations and goals that he's outlined. And so then to start your season opener with a loss to a group of five school that you were favored to beat by two touchdowns just kind of comes crashing back to earth. And he was asked about it after like the one and three start. He was like, hey, do you regret making some of those remarks or predictions or forecasts? And he, he kind of said, like, yeah, maybe I could have rephrased it, but I'm not going to apologize for believing in this team. I still believe in this team. And so that's just not who he is in terms of, like, being a guy who's going to hedge his bets or, um, you know, if he's confident in his team, he's going to let you know that. And I, so I think just from, like, a PR standpoint, that was a bad look to start one and three after all the you – know, it's one thing for, like, the media to hype you up, but when it's coming from within the four walls, four walls of the program and you've got coaches saying, you know, we're about to do X, Y, and Z – and then you start one and three, you know, it's not a good look. So he got some heat from the fan base for that. But then, you know, we kind of uh, righted the ship a little bit with two Big 12 wins. He beat his former employer, Baylor, who was the only team that really kind of blew us out last year. And so it feels like he's back on the right side with, you know, 99% of the fan base. Um, even with the tough start, I was never out or doubting anything. You know, I think he's 100% the right guy for the job. Uh, but yeah, besides that, everybody loves him. They think that, you know, we're on the right course, had higher expectations for this season. Um, but yeah, overall, I think most fans would give him an A. You, so with Joey McGuire's comments, you just mentioned it, him confident in that quarterback room with, you know, Tyler Shuck coming back. At, and, you know, he, he even had the guy that's under center now that we're going to see in this Kansas State game, uh, Baron Morton, who's, I mean, he's kind of balling out a little bit right now. So with the confidence you had coming into the season and where you're at now with Tyler Shuff being injured, what can we expect from the quarterback room and going into this game? And and can it progress any more to get you to those preseason goals of, you know, Big 12 title? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so coming into the season, Shuck – Shuck got the nod, and, and that was despite our offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, Zach Kidley, 
uh, comparing Baron Morton's arm talent to Patrick Mahomes. You know, Kit Lee was actually an offensive assistant when Mahomes was quarterback here. And, you know, he said, like, you know, something to the effect of, I don't want to put a bunch of pressure on the guy. And, like, he's still got to learn the game. But, like, his arm talent is just as good as Patrick Mahomes. And you saw that on film last year. His, his first career start was in Stillwater back when, like, kind of before the wheels fell off for Oklahoma State. I think they were ranked, like, seventh in the country that came. And he put some plays on film. You know, he had a couple of mistakes. He had an interception that game, but like he put some plays on film. You're like, okay, he's throwing 40 yards on the run and it's an absolute rope, you know, exactly where it needs to be. Um, There's another play that game. They brought seven guys and kind of like falling back, he throws right over the middle, hits a guy in stride, kind of running a drag route or cross route. So you see plays like that and you go, yeah, this guy can, he can make any throw. It's just a matter of can he, can he read the defense? Can he get there on time? All that good stuff. So I I think the sentiment from most fans was that Morton was always the guy with the higher ceiling, but they were hesitant to play him because Shuck had so much more experience and age and maturity on him. But I I think in practice, we've seen that, you know, that reasoning hasn't really stood up because, you know, Shuck turned the ball over four times against Oregon. And, um, you know, even the Tarleton State game, which was the last full game, you know, that's an FCS opponent. We were kind of struggling to move the ball. So I think Tyler Shuck's absence has actually forced us to – he was a pretty good running quarterback, and without him we've kind of been forced to lean on our starting running back, Taj Brooks, some more. And we found a lot of success with that. And Morton, to his credit, for the most part, has taken good care of the ball. I think he he had one turnover against Baylor. Um, I don't think he had any against West Virginia. And so, you know, you're kind of seeing like the high-end playmaking ability of Morton without kind of the downside of a young quarterback taking his lumps and getting his first bit of experience. So if he can keep that up and the run game continues, I think you're going to see a version of this offense that we probably actually wouldn't have gotten to see when, when Tyler Shuck was the starter. So I, I, I wish Shuck were still healthy. You know, I wish we had that depth because now there's really not much behind Morton. If, if he goes down, we're probably going to play a true freshman, but yeah, I think the offensive identity has changed with the quarterback change. And, you know, if Morton keeps progressing and playing as well as he has, I think we we might have a pretty good balanced approach on offense. For sure. And and you mentioned the offense and, and our next questions around the rushing game, because the rushing game really has been a, a strong suit for Texas Tech this year. You've got Taj Brooks, who seems like more or less that workhouse workhouse run, running back for Texas Tech so far this season. He's currently third in the Big 12 so far in total rushing yards, which is really great. Um, and then between his production with 688 yards on the year and six yards per carry, along with Cameron Valdez, who's also averaging 8.4 yards per carry, what have you liked about Texas Tech's running game so far this season? And, and what, if any, would you say are areas of improvement that you'd like to see uh, moving forward with the rushing game? Really, the only complaint was was just the lack of volume earlier in the season. Um, Wyoming defended the run pretty well, but I also don't think we tried to like force the issue. And I think good teams can do that. If, you know, if they're running the ball in the first half and they're only getting three yards per carry, they don't go away from it and they can kind of slowly break you down throughout the game. Against Oregon, you know, a close game that was very winnable, um, where I think the offense was kind of at fault for not putting it away earlier. Uh, Taj Brooks had six carries for 66 yards in the entire game. And it was like, okay, we're averaging 11 a pop. You know, that's not going to happen on 20 yards per carry or on 20 carries in a game. But it's like, he needs more than six touches if we're going to be successful on offense. And so ever since then, he's actually run for 100 plus yards in four straight games, uh, doing it not only at volume, but um, five, six, seven yards per carry within those games. And so I think we finally found an identity on offense. Uh, that was also a gripe early in the season. It's like, I don't really know what we're trying to do on offense. I don't know what our identity is. And now it seems to be feed Taj, you know, 25 times a game and then go from there. So uh, it's great to see. I looked at the stats last week and he was like number three in the country in terms of yards per carry among guys that had over 60 carries or 80 carries. I forgot what it was. So anybody kind of doing it at his volume, he's really among the best in the country right now. And people don't think of that when they think Texas Tech. You know, they think air it out, throw it all over the yard. But that's really not our bread and butter this year. We're a lot better at handing the ball off. And so I think you'll see heavy doses of that on uh, on Saturday. Thinking about the other skill position um, for your wide receivers, currently you've got six receivers over 100 yards on the season thus far. 
the two guys um, that I would say from a K-State perspective, we're going to be on the lookout for Miles Price and Durand Bradley, um, who are leading the way over 250 yards on this season. Uh, Price is tied for uh, second in, in the Big 12 uh, with four total touchdowns on the year thus far. Um, historically, when I think of Texas Tech, uh, you know, have been some really good wide receivers that have come out of this program. What are you seeing out of that group um, this season? And maybe, you know, outside of those other twos, uh, you know, those two guys, is there anybody else that you think is going to be a threat um, against this K-State secondary, which has very much been a suspect uh, position group for us uh, this this year? Yeah, I think this is going to be kind of a weakness on weakness matchup. Um, coming into the season, if you had asked me which two position groups – on the entire Texas Tech team that I was most worried about. I would have said offensive line and inside linebacker. But if you ask me today, I think wide receiver is actually our weakest position group. Um, we have some capable guys, but like if you look at explosive play analytics or yards after catch stats, we're really not good at it. Like we don't have a home run threat guy. We don't have a guy that is consistently reliably open. Um, against Baylor, we threw to Miles Price over and over. He's kind of like a small, shifty slot receiver. And so we use that to complement the run game. You know, when we weren't running it, we we're just throwing it straight to the sideline with Miles Price. But yeah, very little in the way of like downfield threats. Um, I think those two guys are probably the primary ones to watch. Our starting tight end, Mason Tharp, he's six foot nine, 270 pounds. You can't miss him if he's out on the field, but he is, I think, questionable or maybe even doubtful. So you might not see him on Saturday. And, you know, really, I don't have a good answer for your question. Like if, if somebody else emerges, it'll kind of be a little bit of a breakout performance. And I, I hope looking at kind of the Kansas State secondary and some of the stats they've um, allowed to this point, I hope that it can be a breakout game for a Texas Tech receiver. But we really just haven't seen anything close to that so far this season. Well, switching to the defensive side of the ball, I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't the Red Raiders of 2008, you know, where, where people are just throwing it wherever they want against you guys. I mean, you guys got some studs. But you said the what you think was a weakness going into the season. I mean, it's been led by a uh, redshirt freshman. What's his name? Uh, ben Roberts. Ben Roberts, I mean, yeah. Stud, leading the team in tackles. But you got some other studs on this team. But who are some unknown guys that we got to look forward to that just round this defense out? Because, I mean – they're a pretty salty group. I mean, giving up 14 to West Virginia and they, they almost pitched a shutout in a, a non-con game. Yeah, there's so there's some really good depth on the defensive line. Um, the, the two guys, that, this is probably not the best answer to your question. They're not under the radar, but the two starting interior defensive linemen, Jalen Hutchings and Tony Bradford, they're well known. But besides them, especially last game against Baylor, you kind of saw these uh, redshirt freshmen or sophomore types younger guys emerge. Um, we had a young man named Charles Esters. He got two sacks against Baylor. It, that kind of came out of nowhere. Like he's not really a guy that's been on the two deep even. I think he's like a third string um, edge player for us. Um, another interior defensive lineman, Duda Banks. I think he's a sophomore by classification. He was in the backfield a lot against Baylor. And uh, redshirt freshman also on the edge, Joseph Adetere. All those guys are capable of making plays. And then our starter who was – you know, pretty heavily hyped coming into the season, Steve Linton at that edge position. He was kind of a letdown through five games. And then again, out of nowhere, three sacks, two strip sacks against Baylor on Saturday. And so maybe he's kind of starting to figure some things out. So there's a bunch of different names on the defensive line that uh, that could pop up. Uh, the secondary is really old. We've got two uh, six-year seniors at corner, a fifth-year senior at safety, and a six-year senior at safety. So old guys that have played a lot of snaps, a lot of games. And, uh, yeah, Ben Roberts, you mentioned him. He was not a starter coming into the season. Our, uh, our starting inside linebacker actually, actually got hurt in the first quarter against Wyoming and has not been able to return yet. I don't think he'll be back for Kansas State either. Um, just for reference, on three, you know, the recruiting website, they released their true freshman midseason um, All-American list today, and they're the three true freshman linebackers – you know, good players. They had something like, you know, 20-something tackles, a couple tackles for loss. But Ben Roberts has 45 tackles this season, and that's without starting game one. He has more tackles for loss than all three linebackers that were on the on three freshman All-American list. He's the only one with a sack. He's the only one with an interception and the only one with a forced fumble. So he's not eligible for that list because he is a redshirt freshman. But I think that speaks to his level of play so far. 
he kind of came out of nowhere this year, but he's turned into a real playmaker for us. Out of those position groups, when you look at the defensive line, the linebackers and the DBs, which one do you think matches up the best with K-State and, and what K-State's offensive scheme is going to bring? Because you mentioned maybe the secondary, or at least on the offensive side of the ball, your wide receivers and our secondaries would be maybe like a week on week. What would you say that for the defense matches up the best with K-State? I think in terms of the past defense, I think our corners are – uh, so Malik Dunlap is probably our best corner. He's got three interceptions this season, probably a borderline all-conference guy. Um, and it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me Kansas State, most of their offense is actually targeting uh, the tight end, the backs out of the backfield, like not a lot of kind of perimeter pass game. And so I, I trust our corners to match up well against y'all's outside receivers. And where I'm more concerned, you know, as good as our linebackers have played, they have been exposing coverage a little bit in some of the intermediate pass game. And with a tight end like Ben Sinnott, and as much as y'all go to the running backs in the past game, I think that could be an area where y'all expose us a little bit. But I, I do trust the corners to hopefully take away some stuff on the outside. And, you know, I think Colin Klein probably sees that and is going to stick to what y'all are good at. So I think you'll see a lot of kind of intermediate stuff over the middle and probably less targeting uh, more toward the boundary. So thinking specifically about Saturday um, and that night game matchup, I'm curious to hear um, what do you think some keys to victory would be if you um, if you're Texas Tech trying to beat K-State this weekend? And then maybe what are some areas that you think K-State could take advantage of um, some of Texas Tech's weaknesses? I think for Texas Tech, like I said, it kind of needs to be a get right game of sorts. You know, uh, Kansas State has been vulnerable to giving up the explosive plays in the secondary it's not something we've excelled at all season. So it'd be a, a really good time to sort of have your first kind of, I don't know, post route or seam route that somebody finally goes for 50 or 60 yards. Um, you, earlier, I forgot to uh, touch on this, but Cameron Valdez, our backup running back. So Taj Brooks is like your, he's sort of built like a bowling ball. You know, he's built for 25, 30 touches a game. His longest carry on the season can't be more than like 30 yards. So he's not, but he gets 18, 24, 16, you know, consistently. Valdez is a guy that uh, he's kind of like if Taj is thunder, Valdez is lightning. And so that wouldn't come in the passing game, I don't think, because we're not really good at executing screens. But Valdez is very capable of kind of taking one the distance. So I, I hope that's an area. Um, we, we do play a lot better at home than on the road in terms of like winning the turnover battle and some stuff like that. So I think that's sort of what like we're going to have to unlock something that we haven't to this point on offense with some explosive plays think we need to win the turnover battle by about two at home and where I see Kansas State potentially um, leaning into some of their strengths and coming out on top you know as good as Taj Brooks has been I think this will be the most stout run defense we've faced and I, I think y'all are giving up maybe like three to three and a half yards per carry to opposing running backs so that's sort of a strength on strength matchup that if y'all win and kind of make us one-dimensional on offense you know, I, I don't think we want to lean on the pass game with a, a young quarterback. You know, we want we want Taj to be successful on 25 or 30 carries. But if y'all can take us out of that early in the game and force us to throw a lot, I know that's not what y'all's defense is best at defending. But from an offensive identity perspective, I don't think that's really a game we want to play either. So I, I think if, if Kansas State wins, it's probably going to look something like that. You want me to take these Twitter poll questions, Bob? Take these Twitter poll questions. Let's get right into them. Uh, so we put them out to the to the cokeheads. I think that's what we're calling them. I, you know, we're all fucking cokeheads at this point. But uh, who is this? T. How do you say that name? T. Kellums. 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 I like that. Do you guys know him? No, but <laughs> I know how, I know how to read. So uh, well. <laughs> all right, Matt. <laughs> You're fire, fireball. Matt's on one right now. Okay. Uh, so he he asks, what's your favorite? K State and Tech game in the past five years. Also, how do you feel about the new schools and any future new rivalries brewing? Ooh. Um, I have a really short attention span, so you're gonna have to remind me of the second question in a minute. But uh favorite tech K State game of the last five years, gonna take y'all back to a crisp fall morning in 2021. Texas Tech enters the game, I think like five and two, like not having a bad season by any stretch, with like the 82nd ranked recruiting class in the country. And we go into halftime with a lead over K-State. We come out in the second half, don't score a single point. 
Felix and DK Uzama blows us up on a run play. I think we tried to field a punt at like the one, which is just so emblematic, emblematic of that tenure. And so we start on the one, hand the ball off, King Felix blows it up. Um, all the momentum is Kansas State's. We lose that game, and controversial to some, we fire the head coach the following day. And uh, we have to give K-State a ton of credit for setting us on the right course because that recruiting class went from 78 to like 36 in about two weeks. And no looking back on the recruiting trail. After that game, we, we uh, have that 62-yard walk-off field goal against Iowa State to punch our ticket to our first bowl game at the time since 2017. Parlay that into our first bowl victory since 2013. And uh, then the following season, when Joey McGuire's like in full time in year one, we have our first winning record in conference play since 2009. Uh, all these other firsts, first time we beat Texas and OU in the same season, get another bowl appearance, another bowl win. So I have to give you all a ton of credit for just – like our program was at rock bottom and y'all pretty much blew it up and made sure that we had to make a change. And so Kansas state will always have a special place in my heart for your role in getting us back on the right trajectory. I just have to say about that game. Um, I, uh, I miss watching that game. Um, I was down in Austin. Uh, I was a weekend of the formula one race and um, where that race is, you have no cell service whatsoever. And so that was an 11 o'clock kick. I went to the, I was there at the race and I had no cell service, but I got a halftime thing and we were down and I'm like, you gotta be shit me. Okay. This is good. Like, this is good. I don't, I'm not watching it. And I did not get a notification for the rest of the day until I left the track and I see we won. I'm like, what the fuck did we, how did this happen? So I was obviously very happy about that. And I'm glad that we provided some value. Like we provided yes. an upward trajectory for you. So that was, was very- also, that was the infamous Tim Brando can't fucking pronounce Felix's oh, name. Oh, it's rough. That drove me insane. <laughs> it tried like Nothing. four times. And like at some point, just give him be like, you know, the big man gets the sack. Like if you don't know his name, just quit trying, you know? Nothing um, changes. He's exactly the same two years so later. Bad. He's so bad. And that, so when we fired Matt Wells uh, at five and three, like people like Joel Klatt were like, oh, this is an abomination. Like they can still go to a bowl game and think about the kids. And it was like, okay, the part of the five, like we played Florida International, uh, barely beat Stephen F. Austin, played some other, oh, Houston, like another group of five team. So three of them were group of five. One of them was Kansas, like before they were this year's Kansas. And so, like, four of the five were just an absolute joke. It was like, you know, Texas 70-pieced us this year. We didn't score in the second half and lost to Kansas State. Like, this is totally justified. We've got 11 kids in the recruiting class, and he's telling us that, like, our roster is full. And so, anyway, uh, it was it was also gratifying that Joey McGuire found so much success instantly and, like, kind of proved that it was the right decision to make a change. Uh, but, yeah, since, since we haven't beat you all in the last five years, I have to say that's my favorite because I pretty much only have five L's to choose from there. And so that has to be my favorite. <laughs> That's a great answer, though. Um, so this question comes from Will underscore KSU. Big fan of the show. Uh, Texas Tech has some elite uniform combinations. Which uniform of theirs is your favorite? Really anything that incorporates the throwback, like the flat double T. I think our, our current 3D or beveled double T looks like it was made in like Microsoft Word Art in 1999, and that that's when they did um, unveil it. So anything that kind of looks like it was from the 90s or the 70s, I don't really care if it's black, white, red. I think all of our throwbacks look good. And I think anything we wear that kind of has the modern look kind of sucks. So I hope that someday we go back to the classic look full time, or at least just sort of, I just don't know what we're doing. I, I, I love K-State's uniforms. You know, it's simple, it's iconic, it's classic looking, it's clean. And we've got like these dumb like chevron stripes and we've like a black stripe stacked on top of a white stripe on our pants and it looks just really dumb to me so is, anything with the throwback is my favorite uniform combo is that a is that an under armor thing or like w- w- i mean there was a whole under armor debate with through the <laughs> kansas state community not too long <laughs> ago but like would you want to go like to a nike or a jordan or anything like that um yeah so i hate under armor 
Um, I, I don't really care personally. Like uh, to me, it's just a logo. But I know that the the youth don't like Under Armour, and like it sounds stupid. But if you're recruiting a 16 year old and he wants to wear Nike, and like you're with what's perceived to be the third worst of those three brands, like that's not good. What I would love is I don't know if y'all are Chiefs fans, but uh, of course our boy Patrick Mahomes, the greatest player of all time, he's with Adidas. I would love to see some sort of Adidas Mahomes partnership with Tech, um, and for us to get away from Under Armour, I would I would gladly welcome an upgrade like that. I do have a quick follow up. So where are you at with the level the bevel crusade that you're yes. fighting right now? Level it. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know. I think that they'll probably look at that if and when they do change apparel companies. And by the way, our contract with Under Armour is up after this season. So if we're going to make a change, now's the time. I think if they're going to do that, if they're going to switch everything from Under Armour to Adidas, they might look at, okay, do we change the double T look and all that? So I don't know, maybe that's the right time to make another push. If they do announce a switch to Adidas, maybe we can fire that back up. That's funny. Um, so we got a question about recruiting. Uh, Obviously, some big news recently um, was beating out the University of Texas for Micah Hudson, um, five star plus. Is he one of the five star pluses? Yeah, okay. The plus thing is so annoying. But anyway, um, obviously, that's huge for Texas Tech. Um, so, how did it feel when you heard about the announcement? Um, how, what do you think a commitment from him specifically is going to be able to bring to that recruiting class? It felt really cool. It was it was a sort of a weird mix of emotions because back in the summer, we all thought he was like a silent commit. And we were like, why is he waiting to announce this? Like we it would be really cool for the world to know that a five star is committed to Texas Tech. And then like you start to worry, like, OK, is there a reason he's not announcing it? Why is he taking another visit here or there? And like then you lose to Wyoming and you're like, damn, like he might have been committed and then decommitted before anybody even knows that he ever committed to Tech. And then like when we're 0-2 is actually when he announced it publicly. And yeah, not only do we beat out Texas, I think we beat out like literally everyone. I think he had Notre Dame, Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State. Um, you know, you it, but the the flip side of that with recruiting is like you never celebrate until pen hits paper. Um, so I don't know, like maybe ask me in December. Like I don't want to be a, a wet blanket here, but y'all know how recruiting goes. And so uh, when he's like in a Red Raider uniform and on the roster and on the field, I'll probably be able to exhale a little bit. Uh, but yeah, like it speaks volumes about the recruiting momentum. Um, I should have pulled this before the show too, but there was all this data we had about like 5.7 rated three stars on rivals or higher. Like that's considered a high end three star. To me, that's kind of a big deal for a program like tech. Um and Joey had more 5.7s or higher in like a year and a half than we had in like five years before he got here. And then you could cut it the same way with like four stars. He had more four stars in his first two classes than we had the six classes before something. I'm making that up off the top of my head, but he was clearly getting results on the recruiting trail um, like his predecessors just had not been able to. And yeah, like to be honest, I didn't know we were really capable of getting a five star. Um especially kind of in the NIL era when, you know, Georgia can just pay him a million dollars if they want. And like, how are you going to compete with that? But the thing you always talked about was just the relationships with the coaching staff, not just McGuire, but some of the assistant coaches on the scouting and recruiting team. And so I think they're like, they're not bullshitting when they talk about the importance of relationships and all that. And it, it's resonated on the recruiting trail with, with guys like Mike Hudson and a lot of sort of under the radar guys that um, have really good measurables. They love track and field guys. And so like a good example of this panning out, we we were the only power five offer for this two star inside linebacker in South Carolina last year. Like we're going way out of our recruiting footprint, offering this guy that nobody else wants. Uh, he's like the fastest 110 meter hurdler in South Carolina high school history or something like that. And he gets to campus and like he's playing right now as a true freshman. Like I said, we had some injuries at inside linebacker. He's playing and he's good as a true freshman. He's he's obviously fast. And they've got dudes like that up and down all the recruiting classes, like these hurdlers, these sprinters, these high jumpers, triple jumpers. They're looking for that track and field athleticism and kind of saying, okay, if you've got the athleticism and the speed, we can coach you on, you know, the fundamentals, the techniques of football. Uh, there, there's a rumor. I don't think this has ever been substantiated. They won't take an offensive lineman unless he can dunk a basketball. And so they're just, they're looking for kind of athletic freaks. And they're saying, even if you don't have the stats in high school or, you know, the accolades, 
if you can do things like jump really high, run really fast, lift a lot of weight, like we'll teach you how to play football. So I'm excited to see what they do from a development standpoint over the next few years, because they certainly have some athleticism in these classes coming in. And if they can actually mold them into football players, it could be really exciting. That definitely makes sure Matt is never going to get a scholarship to Texas Tech. Um, <laughs> yeah, you and me both, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll play you one on one and kick your ass. Oh. Now. <laughs> Just shut your shut your pie hole down there. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, uh, another one from my boy Will the Thrill. Uh, he says, as a Tech fan, and I love these ones because this is th this is a good balance. Because would you rather see a Big Twelve? football championship or make a final four run in basketball. Cause you don't really take any hardware home for a final four, but you know, well, I guess you get the nets, but what, what do you think? I think had you asked me a few years ago, I don't know. Like we've been to the final four in 2019. Uh, Should have come home with some hardware. Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. Um, I would say in our specific case as a program that hasn't won an outright conference football championship since the Dwight Eisenhower administration. I'd probably take that. Um, and, and kind of just being realistic too, about the new college football landscape. Like I hate to say it, but Kansas state and Texas tech are not ever going to win a national title in football um, in, in the current format. And so doing things like winning your own conference and then going to a new year, six bowl, beating another, like if you beat the ACC champion in the orange bowl or peach bowl or whatever, like that's a really good season. That's about all you can ask for. And like, I don't mean that as a shot at the conference or anything, but like you kind of saw it last year with TCU, they go, they win 13 games and then lose by 70 to Georgia. Like it, it's probably just not ever going to happen. Maybe, it, maybe there's some miraculous run or some down year where it happens. But I think for programs in the new big 12 going forward, like winning the conference, especially in a 16 team league, like that's a pretty big feather in your cap first, like, you know, winning the big six in 1942, like, okay, you were the best team in like a tri-state area Nowadays, if you win your conference, like you're winning a coast to coast deal with 16 teams. So I would probably take that over the final four at this point. But, you know, like if I was, I don't know, if I was UCF or somebody like that that has no basketball history, I might lean the other way. So with this current Texas Tech football game, another question from from Will, which side of the ball, offense or defense, do you feel like has the most swagger right now for Texas Tech? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, so that was something we noticed in the West Virginia loss was like, there was nobody that looked like they were energetic, fired up, you know, excited to be playing football. Yeah. We, we have seen a difference since then. And so like both sides will kind of talk shit and kind of have that swagger. Like, so on offense, something we love to do. And I think y'all go pretty fast tempo wise as well, but uh, you know, teams fake injuries against us all the time to get a timeout and sub when, like, we're not letting them sub. And if y'all try that, our offensive line will all pat their heads, like, at the guy who's faking the injury. And hopefully it is a fake injury. Like, if we're taunting him, hopefully he doesn't have, like, a broken leg or something. Um, so they do that. And, like, the defense, probably the quarterback of our defense is the free safety, Dadrian Taylor Demerson. He loves to talk noise to the opposing team. So I don't know. They both kind of have it. Um at least in spurts, but I'd probably give the edge to the defense. They seem to have like more guys that are sort of eager to let you know they just beat you on a play. Well, I, I want to piggyback off of that one real quick because I want to ask a real question. This K-State, you know, tech game is going to be, I mean, the spread's one. It's going to be a tight game. So two minutes left or make it a minute 30 left in the game. Who would you rather have out there, the offense or the defense? The I would say the game's I, tied. The game's tied. Uh, yeah. let's, let's throw that in there. I would say the defense, um, you know, like our offense has been in that spot. Well, take that back. Our offense has been in that spot twice. Like we were down 20 to 17 in Laramie and needed to score to get to overtime. And they, they got it into field goal range, but then against Oregon, you know, like we were down one, had the ball and we coughed it up. Um, and we're in the situation again in Morgantown, actually. We we had like first and goal and uh, threw four shots to the end zone and couldn't get it to overtime. So I think the defense, um, especially in a scenario like that, where like theoretically you'd kind of be forcing Kansas State to go through the air. Um, I, I think our defense can excel when we've 
made the opponent one dimensional. I mean, kind of like key in on what they're about to do next. I just don't know if I trust a young quarterback, you know, in that spot yet. And you know, it'd, be, it'd be one thing like if we had four and a half minutes on the clock and we could run it. Uh, that'd be one thing, but like a two minute drill, I probably would rather have our defense out there to try to make a stop. All right. Last question. Um, obviously we have four new teams in the big 12 this season. We got four more coming next year. Which of the new eight do you see Texas Tech building a, the latest and greatest rivalry with? It's a good question. Um, Houston would be the natural answer to a lot of people just because it's in state and we were in the old Southwest Conference with them. I've got to tell you all, that was the worst of the four, like by far. We should have taken UConn or I don't know, like they're about to play Texas. And the only season that they're in the same conference as Texas before Texas leaves. And like, there's a million seats available. Their entire home stadium is going to be orange for that game. I mean, it's just pathetic. And so like, if the other team isn't taking over the stadium, it's empty. And they play the same card as like the Pac-12 schools. When you see an empty Pac-12 stadium, they're like, well, there's so much to do in Los Angeles. How do you expect us to go to six football games every fall? They do that. They're like, well, it's Houston. Like there's so much to do here. And so it's just not a good cultural fit with like a conference of college towns like Morgantown, Manhattan, Lubbock, where like people's Saturdays revolve around the football team. It's, it's just not that way there. And they're just really banking on like, oh, we'll keep the Houston kids home. We'll recruit well. We'll be good. It's like nobody in Houston wants to go to Houston anyway. Like if they're really good, they're probably getting SEC offers. And, you know, they're probably if they're not quite at that level, they'd probably rather go to TCU or Baylor or Tech than go to Houston. So. A uh, long way of saying it won't be Houston. I think they're going to be cellar dwellers. I think they, they're they a delusional fan base, man. Like they think that Tech is a rivalry and that like they're going to dominate that. And it's like they've beaten us once since probably like Bill Clinton was president. I, I don't even know. But um, I'm interested in Arizona because way back in the day, we were in the border conference with them and uh, – most listeners probably won't even know what the border conference is, but we we won like nine border conference championships back in the day. It's like our only successful period of football. And uh, with all the conference realignment stuff, like in the old Big 12, when we only played Kansas State and other teams in the North uh, every other year or twice every four years, you know, we've actually played Arizona more times than like most of those Big 12 North schools. And when they come in, I think Oklahoma State, TCU, and Baylor – will be our only conference opponents that we've played more than Arizona. And so we're actually going to have more kind of familiarity and history with them as a program than, you know, 75% of the new Big 12. Um, so I hope we can lean into that. You know, of course, they've got their big in-state rivalry that's going to be primary to them. But I would love to be their kind of secondary rival if they're open to it. Um, I, I would much rather play that game up than Houston. I think they agree too. We had a Big Twelve roundtable back in August with oh, the, cool. the four the four incoming new members, and and I think the Arizona fans were in Arizona State also were pretty stoked to have that border conference history with Texas Tech and some of the shared history when they were all in the whack together in the '60s with BYU and Utah as well. Yeah, some interesting conference history down in the Southwest. For sure. But uh, also the fact that Houston fans are comparing Houston to Los Angeles. <laughs> is Galveston the new Malibu? Or are you surfing in yeah, Galveston? Or... <laughs> oh my, Is that is so what? good. Is Galveston <laughs> the new Malibu? Holy shit. I mean, I are people it. going to the San Jacinto Memorial and saying like that's that's like going to Big Bear or something? I just don't get that at all. They're like, you know, do you have any idea what kind of like food scene we have in Houston? And I'm like, you can go to dinner after the game. Like, you know, you, you get six Saturdays a year for this. And for people like me and you that like live and breathe and die this, like it's a big deal. You're not gonna like, oh well, you know, yeah, there's a game today, but I think I'm gonna go to the pumpkin patch. Like, <laughs> no, like do you, you do that on Sunday if you need to with your family or like, hey, you can eat 365 days a year. There's six football games in your home stadium. Every right. Year. You know, get your ass to the stadium if you care about your team. Like they obviously don't. Um, it's like a running joke that they have no fans on Twitter, and like there are like four or five of them. But it's just they have this really good in-depth knowledge of the Southwest Conference days when they beat Texas Tech. But it's like, you know, guys, that was that was a quarter century ago. And since then, like, I don't know, y'all have kind of devolved into this high school program, more or less. You know, they'll, they'll like talk crap about, you know, Carl Lewis winning a gold medal. It's like you know, those are the 1980s guys. Like we've got Patrick Mahomes right now. Um 
you know, what are we doing here? It's like, it's like they fell asleep when the Southwest conference dissolved and woke up and are just like, yeah, we're still here, baby. Like we, we run this thing. It's like, no, you don't. You really don't. Hey, <laughs> Houston's a basketball school. They're a basketball school now. Are they going to be the next way till basketball season? Maybe that's the. No, they're taking Kansas. They sports. might. <laughs> yeah. And even that their final four is totally fraudulent. They didn't play a single or they didn't beat a single digit seed. They played like a 16, a 12, an 11, and a 10 to get to the final four. And then, like, they, they did have a, a legitimate tournament win this past year. I think they beat um, a one or a four or something like that. But, like, even their final four run, the only thing they've done since Hakeem Olajuwon was totally fraudulent. So I do not respect Houston as a as a city, as a university. I just I just got done telling you it's not a rivalry. Like, I guess it is because I don't like a rivalry. I'm not <laughs> It's like an insignificant like gnat that just like annoys you, you know. Um, so I don't know. I it's like a team that I would hate to lose to, but beating them like doesn't move the needle for me. If that makes sense, I mean, it'd be like if y'all lost to Wichita State, you'd be like, okay, that sucks. But like nobody's like really fired up to beat Wichita State. Everybody in Texas hates Houston, other than people <laughs> that live in Houston. Right. That's very. I mean, it's, like, <laughs> it's a cool city to visit. Like I mean, if you appreciate. H town culture, like yeah, they've got incredible music, incredible cuisine, all that. But it's like I don't want to live there. Like the traffic sucks, it's muggy. Um, so yeah, I can. Anyway, I think we should have taken UConn instead. Give uh, give West Virginia more of a regional travel partner. Get a real basketball school that um, you know they've got like five natties in men's hoops in the last or like this century. So I don't know. I know UConn football would have sucked. Like that would have been kind of lame to play UConn football, but. Go to a game in Houston next time K-State plays there and tell me that's not lame. I will tell you it's lame because, because <laughs> I agree. And I, I also think they've got just the dumbest name for a stadium ever. TD, TDECU Stadium it just doesn't yeah. roll off the tongue. Every other stadium has has at least a, like a catchy name or something. Right. <laughs> anyway, what's your final score prediction for the matchup on Saturday? And then plug whatever you want to. So – the last two games, I predicted that we would not cover. Our uh, last three, but we won the last two, so I, I don't want to like jinx it here. Uh, we do play a lot better at home. Well, with a one point spread, though, I can't really get away with saying like, "Well, we'll we'll win, but we won't cover." Um, I don't know, man. I'll say like somebody's going to win thirty-one to twenty-seven, but I don't know who. Is that? <laughs> am I allowed to get away with that? I think that's fine. <laughs> I mean, you're not going on the record, really. So I see it. I see it like low 30s, high 20s kind of game. Yeah. And and it, I really do think it could go either way. Like it might be a matter of who has the ball last. I think both teams are going to struggle a little bit in some aspects, and some might you know find success in other aspects. But it should be a really close game. And like I don't know if y'all follow analytics stuff very well. I know that we're both kind of having disappointing seasons. But like behind Texas and OU, who like I said are probably going to Arlington. Uh, West Virginia's there, but like the winner of this game, I think their odds of going to the conference championship game, according to K Ford ratings, goes up to like 17%, and the loser goes down to one. And so, as desperate as we might be, like hanging on by a thread here, clinging to some kind of hope, I think the winner of this game might be like, hey, we're we have a case to say we're like the third or fourth best team in the Big 12 with like Kansas, West Virginia also in the mix. And whereas the loser is kind of like, okay, yeah, we're we're not competing for anything near the top of the Big 12. Let's just make it to a bowl game. So I know it's not maybe as high profile of a game as we thought it could be preseason, but I do still think there's a lot to play for for both sides. Definitely, definitely. Well, Kyle, we appreciate you uh, hopping on with us tonight. Go ahead and plug whatever you want to and uh, let, the, let the listeners and viewers know where they can find you. Yeah, appreciate y'all having us. Uh, we love chopping it up with other schools' podcasts and content creators. We're uh, we're at Gambling Gauchos everywhere, mostly on uh, Twitter and YouTube. Uh, we do Instagram. I, I think we have a Threads account that we haven't posted on in like two months. But uh, if you use Threads, we're over there uh, not posting. So yeah, we do uh, we do two live streams every week on YouTube, Wednesday night and Sunday night, and then uh, every Saturday night when the last Big Twelve game goes final, we do kind of a look around the conference weekly recap sort of deal. So we welcome all fan bases to to join those or to just listen to us if they want some insight on Texas Tech. Awesome, awesome. We'll appreciate you coming on again. Uh, for all of us here at Cocaine Willie, thanks for listening to the show on your podcast feed or watching us on YouTube. Do us a favor, 
If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, leave us a five-star rating and follow the show. Also follow at Gambling Gauchos on YouTube and, and everywhere else podcasts can be found. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, give us a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, even if you're not a K-State fan. I know we've got a ton of opposing fans that listen to these uh, week in and week out. So give us a, give us a like, give us a subscription. We, we need it. We need it. We love it. Uh, follow the show on Twitter <laughs> or Instagram or follow us individually. I am at Bob Trollsby. Matt is at Matt Marchesini and Chef is at Chef Andre Napier. Chef, take us out of here. Cocaine's a hell of a drug, baby. We are all coke and no joke. Wildcat country. Let's fucking ride, baby. Mm. Let's ride. Let's ride. Let's ride.